This podcast is brought to you by Dr. Kirk Elliott, PhD in an uncertain economy. If you're looking for wealth management solutions and financial advice, go to kirkelliottphd.com and make an appointment today. Coming up, I'll discuss the road ahead for the House GOP and also the big challenge ahead for Israel in its long war against Islamic terrorism. Middle Eastern expert Eric Stackelback joins me. We're going to talk about several aspects of the Israel-Hamas war, including the political situation within Israel and uh, also the insidious motives of Hamas. Uh, hey, if you're watching on Rumble or listening on Apple, Google, or Spotify, please subscribe to my channel. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Show. America needs this voice. The times are crazy. In a time of confusion, division, and lies, we need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. Guys, so much going on in the country that in this opening segment, I'm going to touch on two or three different things and then hone in on an in-depth conversation about what's going on in, in Israel. I have Eric Stackelback, the veteran author and journalist, and someone who really knows this territory very well. I'd like to start by talking about police state. It is uh, now, what, uh, 11 days until we have the first theatrical run of the movie, October 23rd, Monday, just a week from this coming Monday. So um, October 23rd and 25th, those two days, we have bought out hundreds of theaters. The movie tickets are available on the website, which is policestatefilm.net. And uh, it's understandable that people don't like to plan a month in advance, but now we're getting close, and so it's time to make some plans. This is a great movie to see in the theater. We make it for the theater, and uh, so to go, but also to go with like-minded people. You know, round up your extended family, or put up a little notice in your church and have people buy tickets and meet you there, or go with a conservative or Republican group. It's fun to see this movie that way. And so those are two days, October 23rd and 25th. Lots of theaters. And when you go to the website, you plug in your zip code, theaters come up, you just decide, just go ahead and buy the tickets right there. Very easy to do. Now, if you can go to the theater, there's a virtual premiere Friday, October 27th. And that's cool. You can watch the movie at home and it's going to be terrific. We have um, live music, which is related to the movie. We have the full film, which will play, and then a Q&A uh, to follow with Dan Bongino and me, and that's all for the price of a movie ticket. Again, tickets for that, um, policestatefilm.net. It's the one-stop shop to, to get your tickets. Now, um, before we get to Israel, I'd like to talk about the, uh, the speaker race that's going on in the Republican side. Uh, I thought that Jim Jordan would have a really good chance to to win this because I think he has that really nice combination of being philosophically sound, but also temperamentally genial. He's well liked, but Republicans by and large tend to kind of go with the, I'd call it the next in line. And this has been true for many years with presidential nominations. Now it wasn't true with Trump, but it was, it was true previously. People like Bob Dole, for example, or John McCain. Well, it wasn't so much that they were the best candidate, but you know what? They're next in line, so let's anoint them. And, and Steve Scalise is next in line. He was sort of deputy to Kevin McCarthy, and it looks like he has gotten the, um, the most votes. Now, this was, an, interestingly, in a, in a secret ballot. So this was not a case where GOP representatives went public and said, I'm for Scalise or I'm for Jordan. It's a secret ballot. And Scalise appears to have come out ahead, but he doesn't quite have enough votes, which means he would have to make some deals with some wavering or reluctant Republicans to get him the majority nod. We'll see what happens What happens there. The other interesting news is that uh, Robert Kennedy uh, Jr. has made it official. He's going to run as an independent. And no sooner did he announce this that four of his siblings came out and denounced him. So this is Rory Kennedy, Kerry Kennedy, Joseph P. Kennedy, Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, 
They say that Bobby might share the same name as our father, but he does not share the same values, vision, or judgment. Very interesting statement because I think that um, Robert F. Kennedy's point is the exact opposite. His point is that the Democratic Party is no longer the party of John F. Kennedy or Robert uh, Kennedy, his brother. The Democratic Party has shifted in dramatic ways ideologically. It's become more extreme. It's pivoted sharply to the left. It's also become a more kind of gangsterized party. And Robert F. Kennedy knows all this. Now, he's sometimes accused of being a spoiler, a spoiler for the Democrats. And I do think there's some debate about this. Would he take more votes away from Republicans or would he take more votes away from Biden? Uh, I'll leave this topic for another day. I think he's going to take more votes away from Biden. Uh, but 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 what he says is that he's going to take votes away from both of them. He says basically that he wants to declare his end of independence of the Democratic Party and quote, my intention is to spoil it for both of them. So essentially what he's arguing is that the two parties have become locked into sort of rival extremisms and that he, Robert F. Kennedy, is going to peel certain ideas from the left side of the aisle, certain from the right, and put together a centrist coalition that will actually have a chance to win. Now, do I think that that is the case? No. Uh, I do think that ultimately he will end up being probably a spoiler for one side or the other. And um, But it's a very interesting development because it changes the complexion of 2024. We won't have two names on the ballot. We'll really have three names on the ballot. And, and that creates an unpredictability. I mean, think back to when Ross Perot ran and the unpredictability that it created between Clinton uh, and and Bush, uh, and arguably that the Perot factor may have cost Bush that. Was it, honey, the 1992 election when Perot ran? Uh, yes, yeah, I think Bush it was. Cost, it was the what cost um, cost Bush the election. Yeah. Uh, I hope that if that if we if we do see a spoiler role, that this time it's uh, a, a role that will go the other way and spoil it for the Democrats. If aches and pains are your problem, Relief Factor is your remedy. You need to start trying it and taking it. Debbie and I uh, started taking Relief Factor a couple of years ago. We've seen a huge difference in our joints. Nothing short of amazing. Aches and pains are totally gone thanks to this 100% drug-free solution called Relief Factor. How does it work? Relief Factor supports your body's fight against inflammation. That's the source of aches and pains. More than a million people have tried Relief Factor and about 70%, the vast majority, have gone on to order more. Debbie's a true believer. She can now do exercises that for a long time she wasn't able to do. So Relief Factor has been a big game changer for her, her aunt, other members of our family, Mike here in the studio, and for many other people. You too can benefit. Try it for yourself. Order the three-week quick start for the discounted price of just $19.95. Go to relieffactor.com or call 800 for relief to find out more about this offer. Number again to call, 800 for relief or go to relieffactor.com. Feel the difference. Guys, I'd like to welcome to the podcast Eric Stackelback. He spent two decades covering the Middle East. He's Senior News Director for Trinity Broadcasting Network, that's TBN. He's also host of TVN show. It's called The Watchman and The Watchman Newscast on YouTube. Uh, the website, by the way, is just watchmantv.com. Uh, Eric, thanks for joining us. Uh, obviously, tragic circumstances and a lot of the analysis that I'm seeing uh, about the Hamas attacks is starting by looking at the Israeli side, the casualties, the carnage, the, the, the babies who were killed. Uh, I'd like to actually start on the other side, which is to say on the Hamas side. Uh, I don't think a lot of people know about Hamas. We hear about these terrorist groups, you know, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, um, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas. And I think people think they're kind of all the same. Are they all the same or are there some important differences? What What makes Hamas different? They have some very important, all these groups, Dinesh, first of all, thanks for having me again. All of these groups have certainly similarities. One of the shared similarities is the annihilation of Jews and the state of Israel. That's for starters. What makes Hamas different 
is that it is a self-professed arm of the Muslim Brotherhood, a movement we've heard a lot about over the years. They've taken some lumps over the past decade or so. Their main power base in Egypt has been weakened, obviously. But when Hamas was founded in 1987, Dinesh, its founding charter professed we are the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. When it comes to the Brotherhood, that's really kind of the granddaddy of them all when it comes to modern day Islamic jihadist movements. So that, number one, uh, sets Hamas apart. Number two, largely Palestinian based, obviously Gaza, they rule with an iron fist, but also the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, uh, a very strong presence there. But what I think is the main thing that sets Hamas apart is its support network right here in the West. And I'm not necessarily talking about physical, tactical support, but the cheerleaders for Hamas that we see throughout the United States and Europe. We've seen this for many years, these American Islamic umbrella organizations, purported civil rights organizations that are literally cheerleaders for Hamas that will not condemn these demonic atrocities that we saw over the weekend. So I think that is the main thing, Dinesh, that sets, sets Hamas apart in the polite company, quote unquote, of some of these so-called civil rights organizations. Hamas is accepted and even cheered right here in the West. Now, let's think about why that is, because the ordinary American, even a leftist on a campus or a left wing professor is not likely to cheer for, for Al Qaeda. Right. They're not likely to cheer for ISIS. Those are like beyond the pale. But on the other hand, you find that Hamas uh, does have a lobby, if you will, in the West. Now, is that because um, Hamas can claim that it is championing the anti-colonial cause, that it's representing an ethnic group of people that have had their rights uh, abridged, if not taken away. Is that what gives Hamas that kind of special shine that you don't see on uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda? I think you hit on it, uh, Dinesh. Absolutely. I think the uh, the struggle against oppression, the Zionist occupier, Israel is an island of Western-style colonialism in the heart of the Middle East. That is the view of so-called academics here in the West in many cases. So I think you hit the nail on the head anything that involves Israel. And look, Hamas has been mostly uh, focused on Israel. Another reason that it's kind of set apart from other jihadi, which are more global organizations, Hamas has been more regional focused on Israel. Guess what? These so-called academics here in the West uh, have a serious distaste for Israel, to say the least. Uh, but remember, that's a key point, Dinesh. But remember, Hamas also has American blood on its hands. Obviously, at least 22 American civilians killed over the weekend. But this goes back. Hamas has killed dozens of U.S. citizens over the years in its attacks in Israel. And we've had Hamas operatives arrested right here on U.S. soil over the years. Interesting. Um, Hamas and Hezbollah. Now, these are two groups that are both operating in Israel. I understand Hezbollah kind of operating from the north, Hamas from the south. Um, Hamas, I believe, is primarily a Sunni group, whereas Hezbollah is a Shia group. Now, is that just a kind of theological distinction or does it have some relevance in, in, in explaining what the two groups are up to, one versus the other? You're right on the Sunni Shia distinction, Dinesh Hamas, Sunni, Hezbollah, Shia. But when it comes to killing Christians and Jews, they put along those theological differences and get along just fine. We've seen this again and again. It was interesting to me when people would say, well, Iran and Al Qaeda would never work together. Iran is Shia. Al Qaeda is Sunni. Again, they will work towards maybe they'll turn their guns on each other at a later date. And they already have. They probably will. But in the meantime, uh, the main enemy, the West. Christians, Jews, the state of Israel, they'll put any theological differences aside and come together towards the furtherance of that evil goal. So yes, Hamas, Sunni, Hezbollah, Shia, but brothers in arms when it comes to attacking Israel and antipathy to the West. We'll be right back with Eric Stackelback, senior news editor for TBN and host of TBN show, The Watchman.
Debbie and I are on a really good health journey, but we still struggle to eat enough fruits, veggies, and fiber, and you know what? That's a requirement. Now, lucky for us, we discovered Balance of Nature, and there's no better way to get all your fruits and veggies plus fiber than with Balance of Nature. This is Balance of Nature's fruits and veggies in a capsule, so easy to take, made from fresh whole produce. The produce is powdered after an advanced vacuum cold process, which stabilizes the maximum nutrient content. And this is Balance of Nature's Fiber and Spice, a proprietary blend of fiber and 12 spices for overall and digestive health. Join Debbie and me. Start your journey to better health right now. Call 800-246-8751 or go to balanceofnature.com. You'll get 35% off your first preferred order by using discount code AMERICA. Again, it's balanceofnature.com or call 800-246-8751. Get 35% off your first preferred order by using discount code AMERICA. America. I'm back with Eric Stackelback, senior news editor of TBN, uh, Trinity Broadcasting Network and host of TBN's The Watchman on YouTube. It's watchmantv.com. Uh, Eric, we're talking about Hamas. We're talking about Hezbollah now. Hamas, as I understand it, does have one distinction, and that is that they were, and I'm not sure if they still are, an elected body in Gaza. So nobody elected Al-Qaeda, nobody elected Hezbollah or ISIS, but Hamas cr was able to run for elections and, and win. Now, is, is Hamas still the legitimate representative of Gaza, or was it a case where Hamas got elected one time and that was kind of the end of elections in, in Gaza? What is it? Yeah, it, it's certainly the latter, Dinesh. Back in 2006, this sent shockwaves around the world when this vicious, murderous terrorist organization was elected uh, by the Palestinians. In 2007, Hamas, after that election, violently evicted the Palestinian Authority of Mahmoud Abbas out of Gaza. And ever since, for the past 16 years or so, Hamas has been the sole ruler of Gaza. Now, a second point here, Dinesh, in the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, Hamas also has a very strong presence. And many believe if Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority were ever to hold elections in the West Bank, that Hamas would win those as well. And that's the main reason you never see the Palestinian Authority hold elections. They know that Hamas would be in power. So we hear a lot about Palestinians being the victims of Hamas. And certainly in many cases, that's true. But there's also certainly a groundswell of support for Hamas among many pal Palestinians as well. I think that's undeniable. And I think you saw that certainly in Gaza with the images over the past few days when these Israeli hostages were dragged into the bowels of hell into Gaza and they were greeted by uh, Gazan civilians cheering and spitting on them. So I think uh, just to summarize and help people understand better, you have the Palestinians concentrated in two pockets. One is the West Bank and the other is Gaza. Gaza has been dominated now for well over a decade by Hamas. But the ruling power in the West Bank is not Hamas. It is this group called the Palestinian Authority, which traces its roots to Yasser Arafat and the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization. So these are two perhaps related, but obviously separate bodies. I mean, you just said that they, they do not hesitate to go to war with each other. Is it the case right now that Israel's counterattack is not against the West Bank and the Palestinian Authority, but is focused on Hamas and Gaza? It is. Yes, Dinesh. And I think a key point here, and I'm glad you brought this up, Gaza and the West Bank are not contiguous. They're not literally, uh, you know, geographically right next to each other. There's separation. They're separated geographically. So a key point there. Right now, yes, you're right. Israel focused on Gaza, which is Hamas's main power base. But the concern is that this conflict will broaden, that the West Bank will flare up, that Hamas and Iran-backed fighters in the West Bank will also start to stir things up, even in the eastern half of Jerusalem. That's a big concern right now, Dinesh, and obviously, in a broader sense, does this become a multi-front war? You mentioned Hezbollah, one of Iran's proxies. I call it the ring of fire that surrounds Israel. By the way, just a reminder for people, Israel is the size of the state of New Jersey. Those are the geographic limitations of Israel. And yet it is surrounded by this ring of fire, armed to the teeth, tens of thousands of rockets, missiles, attack drones, all of these Iranian proxies, whether it's Gaza, 
southern Lebanon, Syria, even Yemen further to the south, a ring surrounding Israel. Hezbollah, who you mentioned, Dinesh, the most lethal in that ring. And the big question now is, does Hezbollah get involved in this and spark a multi-front devastating war? Trump just said something that's getting a lot of attacks, and he called the attack, quote, smart. Now, I think that the people who are expressing outrage are expressing moral outrage, but I don't think that Trump was making a moral point. I think Trump was saying that there is a kind of sly and cunning purpose to these attacks. They weren't See, a lot of times when these things occur, people seem to think this is a death cult. This is totally irrational. These people don't care about their lives. But you can imagine that there are probably Hamas operatives thinking about what's going to be the effect if we do this? What can we anticipate that Israel will do? What do we think that the other Arabs will do? Is this a way to draw other people into this conflict? So let's take a pause because our segment is up, but we'll come right back. And I'd like you to explain what do you think is Hamas's objective, rational or otherwise, for having launched this attack? Want a weight loss system that totally works? I got one for you. Debbie and I made a New Year's resolution. Let's lose some weight. And thankfully, PhD weight loss came to our rescue. Debbie's already lost 24 pounds. I've lost 27. We are both thrilled and on maintenance. The program is based on science and nutrition. No injections, no pills, no long hours in the gym, no severe calorie restriction. Just good, sound, scientifically proven nutrition. It's so simple. They make it easy by providing 80% of your food at no additional cost. They tell you when and what to eat. And guess what? You can do this without ever being hungry. The founder, Dr. Ashley Lucas, has her PhD in chronic disease and sports nutrition. She's also a registered dietitian. She helps people lose weight and, most important, maintain that weight loss for life. So if you're ready to take the step of losing weight like Debbie and I have, call PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition. Here's the number. Write it down, 864-644-1900. You can also find them online at myphdweightloss.com. The number again to call, 864-644-1900. I'm back with Eric Stackelback, um, senior news director of Trinity Broadcasting Network, TBN, host of TBN's The Watchman Show. Eric, um, Hamas, what were they thinking? A few things here, Dinesh. You made a great point before the break. Yes, they have a strategy. This is not haphazard. Just people, just bar they're barbarians, certainly. But there is a strategy. It's not just thousands of men rushing in headlong. This was planned out for years, according to an interview I just watched, Dinesh, with a top Hamas official who said, we planned this for at least two years. They are very strategic in the most evil and sinister of ways. These are not stupid people. I hate to say it, in, intrinsically evil, but they do have a strategy. And what the strategy is here, uh, what the goal is here is simple, in that you have to look back at the head of the snake the Iranian regime. This cannot be uh, under overstated, Dinesh, the role that Iran plays in all of this. Remember, Hamas is a proxy of Iran, funded, armed, and backed by the Iranian regime in Tehran. When Iran says go, Hamas goes, Hezbollah goes. Iran, according to various reports, gave the order here about a week and a half ago for Hamas to proceed with this attack. And on the Watchman, Dinesh, I've been reporting over the past few weeks on this pattern of meetings, I call them terror summits, taking place in Beirut involving Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps leaders. They certainly weren't planning to talk about having a picnic. They were talking, planning and talking about this and launching a multi-front onslaught against Israel. I think it's pretty clear. So Hamas has its own goals, which are the destruction of the Jewish state, the so-called Zionist entity, uh, push the Jews into the sea. That's basic. But they are also serving their Iranian masters who have larger goals. And this attack doesn't happen without the support of the Iranian regime. And I think that's something Israel and the world's going to have to contend with right now. Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister, said, look, we're going to change the Middle East for generations through crushing Hamas. Well, you can change your immediate neighborhood by crushing Hamas, certainly in, in Gaza, and that's a good thing. But to change the region for generations, that means, quite frankly, crushing Hezbollah and, and not directly, perhaps, confronting Iran, but 
through indirect means, Israel has done that many times over the years. But eventually, Iran is going to have to pay consequences for this. There's no way around it. That is the head of the snake. Now, to understand the snake, I'm going to put on my kind of mullah hat for a bit. Uh, and I'm going to look around the region as one of the Iranian mullahs. And I'm going to say that in recent years, and especially under Trump, things were taking sort of a troubling turn. Israel was making uh, deals and pacts with leading Arab nations. Uh, and this offered the prospect not only of peace in the Middle East, but also of sidelining Iran, because suddenly you now have Israel, you have Saudi Arabia, you have Jordan, uh, you have possibly Egypt. So the Iranians go, what can we do that would send a shockwave through the Muslim world, cause Muslims to go crazy and make it impossible for their own leaders to take a pro-Israel stance. Well, what if we launch an attack on Israel? What is Israel going to do? Launch an attack back. We're bound to get tremendous images of, of places being bombed, people running for their lives, you know, people with missing an arm and a leg, blood over them, Muslim children killed. And so then we flash those pictures throughout the world. There's outrage in Pakistan. There's outrage across the Muslim world. Suddenly it becomes impossible for anyone, at least publicly, to do any kind of deal with Israel. Do you think that this is actually what the mullahs were thinking? Yes, they've been thinking this for years. Dinesh, you, you laid it out beautifully. You really did. For years, this has been the strategy. Uh, I call it death by a thousand cuts, the pinprick strategy. Uh, attack Israel incrementally. Israel responds with overwhelming force. The images are beamed out around the world of what's happening in Gaza, a building turned to rubble. But, but by the way, not just arbitrarily, uh, arbitrarily turned to rubble uh, by the IDF. The Israel Defense Forces, I would argue, Dinesh, along with the U.S. military, of course, are the most humane fighting forces in human history. I know that sounds like a big statement, but the rules of engagement for the IDF and the U.S. military are so extraordinary in the lengths that they go to avoid civilian casualties to the point where they will put their own, Israel and the U.S., by, for that matter, will put their own soldiers at risk in order to save civilians. So that's number one. But number two, yes, this is the strategy as you laid it out. But I wonder if this time is different in that, yes, Israel is going to respond with unprecedented force. An unprecedented attack requires an unprecedented response, certainly. So Israel is going to do exactly that. I believe Hamas will be destroyed and completely devastated. And Gaza certainly uh, will pay a heavy price here, no doubt. Hamas is power base. But I think the one thing that perhaps certainly sets this time apart is what Hamas, the, the images of Hamas atrocities. Many times Israel says, hey, they're, they're killing civilians and the footage perhaps wasn't there in some cases. Hamas themselves, Hamas terrorists filmed all of this, butchering children, the elderly Holocaust survivors, babies beheaded, families burned alive. And Hamas filmed it all gleefully dragging civilians as hostages across the border back into Gaza. So right now, much of world opinion, not all, sadly, is with Israel and sees that this is clearly a battle of good versus evil. There's really no gray areas here. Uh, and yet, as you alluded to, Dinesh, as Israel continues the offensive against Hamas and Gaza, we'll see footage beamed out from Gaza. It will be interesting to see if the tide of world opinion changes and turns against Israel, even the Biden administration forcefully pro-Israel statements over the past few days. But does that change when the reality of the situation, when Israel does what needs to be done, does world opinion suddenly go back to its default position, quite frankly, and turn against Israel? We'll be right back with Eric Stackelback, senior editor, senior news director for TVN. Mike Lindell has a passion to help you get the best sleep of your life. Now, he didn't just stop with the classic MyPillow pillow. He also created the Giza Dream bed sheets. We use these. We love them. The sheets look and feel great. 
which means an even better night's sleep, which is crucial for your overall health. Mike found the world's best cotton called Giza. It's ultra soft and breathable, but also extremely durable. And Mike's latest deal, sale of the year for a limited time, you get 50% off the Giza Dream Sheets, marking prices down as low as $29.98, depending on the size. Go to MyPillow.com, enter promo code Dinesh, there you'll find this offer, but also deep discounts on all the MyPillow products, the pillows, the robes, the mattress topper, the MyPillow kitchen towel sets, and so much more. Here's the number to call, 800-876-0227. Once again, it's 800-876-0227, or go to MyPillow.com. Don't forget to use the promo code D-I-N-E-S-H Dinesh. I'm back with Eric Stackelback, Senior News Director for TBN, host of TBN's The Watchman Show. Uh, at YouTube, it's watchmantv.com. Eric, you said something that struck me, which is that Hamas, with almost uh, sadistic delight, has been putting these videos out. Now, why would they do that? In other words, I think, for example, of the Nazis, uh, who were very careful to locate their death camps outside of Germany. They didn't want the Germans to see what they were doing. They they recognize that there's a part of human nature that cannot be okay with that, even if you don't like Jews. Now, didn't Hamas foresee that this kind of exhibitionism of death would not only turn most people against them, but make it difficult for their own allies? I mean, think of people like the squad in in the United States, these socialists who have been very pro-Palestine, very pro-Hamas, but suddenly they're like, oh, we can't say anything. Rashida Tlaib won't say a word when she's asked about this. So Hamas has sort of made it awkward for their own supporters. Why wouldn't they do this carnage and try to sort of hide it, at least hide it from the cameras? I think the sheer... uh opportunity for them dinesh to have such what they see for their cause such a propaganda coup for them for their cause was irresistible these images have galvanized jihadists around the world these images of hamas atrocities have emboldened the iranian regime hezbollah we see rallies in new york city in london germany even australia large pro hamas demonstrations in sydney australia of all places dinesh we had uh, hamas supporters chanting gas the jews so i think it was irresistible for hamas we, we have finally done it was their view we we have invaded israel thousands probably in the thousands of hamas fighters at least 1500 streamed into southern israel and butchered at last count dinesh at least 1,300 Israeli civilians and killed over 100 Israeli soldiers as well. This was Hamas's dream for decades. They finally realized it, so they wanted to broadcast this to the world uh, in almost a triumphalist way, of course. But secondly, the propaganda value, even if one contingent, a small battalion of Hamas fighters had been able to cross over the border, infiltrate Israel, plant that green Hamas flag and send those images across the world, that would be seen as a huge propaganda victory for Hamas, no doubt. But this, the largest slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust, an unprecedented assault on Israel, on Israeli soil. Look, Dinesh, these Hamas terrorists, in some cases in these towns along the border, and I've spent a lot of time along that Gaza border in these very towns, Hamas terrorists held occupied some of these towns for 48 hours un completely unprecedented they had to broadcast this throughout the world including the atrocities sadly there's a large segment in the world that is actually that cheers on those kinds of atrocities and wants to see more and hamas knows that and that's who they are trying to attract in addition to the so-called intellectual class in the west which seems beyond any kind of moral compass when it comes to this and will support Hamas regardless. I mean, speaking of the intellectual class, a very interesting episode at Harvard where uh, a large constellation of student organizations come out, I mean, right in the aftermath of this in solidarity with Palestine and seemingly with approval of the attacks. 
Now, when some corporate people have stepped in and said, you know, okay, give us a the list of the names of all these students who are taking this brave stance because we'll make sure never to hire any of them. I notice now these students are distancing themselves. Oh, we didn't really personally sign the statement. It was never approved by our, the appropriate committees. And a very interesting statement by Larry Summer is kind of a man of the establishment, uh, prominent Democrat, former president of Harvard. Uh, he says, I'm very disappointed in Harvard, but you know, these are the very people who have made Harvard what it is. These are the people who uh, made peace with the left, allowed left-wing faculty to take over these departments, ran the conservatives out, shut down effective debate on these campuses, gave a vent to identity politics. And now they're, aren't they living in a sense with the fruit of their own creation? Sadly, yes. And in one sense, hey, you said the, these folks might not get hired by companies. That's one encouraging sign, Dinesh, that finally the morally repugnant and morally bankrupt views and ideology of the radical left is being held accountable, apparently, in this case. So that's actually kind of refreshing to see. But on the under, uh, other hand, completely distressing to see these are supposed to be our leading lights, leading academic lights in the younger generation and Generation Z. And as you said, sure, I mean, the dust had not even settled from this carnage and they're coming out in full throated support of Hamas. We have and you've covered this for years, Dinesh, more than anyone so eloquently. Folks, we have a problem on America's college campuses. In case you have not realized, this is the Ivy League, the the gold standard, so to speak, and the leading lights at Harvard are pro-Hamas. There's no other way to say it. They are pro-Hamas. They support terror and looks to me like they support genocide because that's what Hamas stands for. And Hamas conducted a mini genocide over the weekend, over a two-day span. No denying that. The image is now, you mentioned the Nazis earlier, Dinesh, uh, hidden largely and then uh, uh, liberating troops, found evidence of the Holocaust, the carnage. This is out there for everyone to see, fully documented by Hamas. We'll be right back with Eric Stackelback, Senior News Editor for TBN. <music> Guys, with the uh, new movie just right up ahead, I'd like to invite you to check out my Locals channel. The movie will be featured on Locals, and if you're an annual subscriber, you will get the movie for free. It's included in your subscription. Now, I post a lot of exclusive content on Locals, content that's censored on other social media platforms. On Locals, you get Dinesh Unchained, Dinesh Uncensored. You can also interact with me directly. I do a live weekly Q&A every Tuesday. No topic is off limits. I've also uploaded a bunch of other films to Locals, documentaries, feature films, mine, films by other independent producers, 2000 Mules is up there and the new film coming out soon, Police State. I'll be giving you the inside scoop on Locals. So check out my channel. It's Dinesh.Locals.com. I'd love to have you along for this great ride again. It's Dinesh.Locals.com. I'm back with Eric Stackelback, Senior News Director for TBN, WatchmanTV.com. Uh, Eric, you know, there was a professor at, uh, I, believe it, I believe, Yale, who describes herself as a radical Muslim. And she was putting out on X, tweeting out that uh, settlers are not civilians. I mean, a kind of a shocking thing to say, because she's saying that families that live, um, that, that are not military families, that are, they're not armed, they're not combatants, by virtue of having settled uh, in these disputed areas are somehow, should be treated like soldiers who it is fine to launch military attacks on. I mean, uh, there's a controversy about it now, but uh, what do you make of that statement? Uh, two things. Number one, how was she hired in the first place? She's a self-professed radical Muslim. How does she have a job at an American university, let alone Yale University? Uh, number two, she's calling the people of Southern Israel settlers. Dinesh, that territory that Hamas invaded over the weekend that has not been disputed. That's been part of Israel proper since 1948, since the modern rebirth of the state of Israel. So these are not disputed territories. So you have to dig deeper here, Dinesh, uh, behind her comments and see that she considers any Jew living in the land of Israel as a settler from Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, southern Israel, and beyond. She's not referring to the settlers in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. She's calling any Jew 
in Israel. What she's saying is the Jews in Israel have no right to be there and should be removed once and for all. That's my translation of what she said on X and what she tweeted out. That's really what these folks want, not only in the military sense, uh, Hamas, obviously a terror organization, guns, bombs, and slaughter, but these groups that seek to boycott and divest from Israel, their goal is also the destruction of Israel just by other means. And I think the academic class uh, certainly falls in that category, and they will cheerlead for the violent wing of this anti-Israel movement time and again. Eric, talk about, let's turn to the Israeli side for a moment, because Israel has been, at least of late, a, a highly polarized society, a lot of controversies around Netanyahu. I remember the massive demonstrations in Israel over the reform of the Supreme Court uh, and other things. Uh, Netanyahu himself facing the possibility of, in, I mean, investigations going on, potential indictments. My question is, is Israel coming together as one over this? Are they able to create, I remember Winston Churchill created kind of a war cabinet after the, the Nazi attacks. He brought in members of the opposition party. It was essentially one Britain facing the Nazis. Is Israel able to do something similar now? And, uh, and what is Israel's war objective? Yes. Uh, to the first part, first, Dinesh, yes. Uh, Israel just announced an emergency unity government where Netanyahu is trying to bring people from all sides of the political aisle in together on a united government. He has succeeded. Benny Gantz, who was one of uh, Netanyahu's rivals, has now joined the government. It's an emergency unity government. So, yes. And the demonstrations, large scale, which you mentioned, Dinesh, over the past nine, 10 months or so, that's out the window now. That's forgotten now. The people of Israel have come together in a way they really haven't in decades, I would say. Uh, it People across all points of the spectrum, politically and otherwise, have been horrified and angered by this, and rightfully so. And they are united. We see footage of Israelis flying back to Israel from around the world to fight. We've got over 300,000 reserves called up. I have friends right now, dear friends, Dinesh, who are on the front lines. They've left their wives and children. They're on the front lines right now. They don't know when they'll return to their families. So yes, Israelis realize that any internal squabbles must be put aside in this instance to quite frankly, preserve the very existence of the Jewish state. So that's number one. Number two, Israel's goals Bibi, as I mentioned earlier, Dinesh said, look, we want to change the face of the Middle East for generations. I think number one there, clearly destroy Hamas. And that sounds simplistic, but listen, at this point, there's been so much nuance and hand wringing over the decades. What do we do about Hamas? If we destroy Hamas, then what? Better the devil you do know than the devil you don't know. That's largely been the philosophy among successive Israeli governments. Clearly, Dinesh, that strategy, the strategy of so-called deterrence, has not worked. Hamas just carried out an unprecedented massacre on Israeli soil. So now there's only one answer there. Destroy this entity once and for all so that it never threatens Israel again. That's first. But secondly, Dinesh, and we touched on this earlier, if and when this turns into a multi-front war, Israel's goals may broaden to, quite frankly, destroying Hezbollah as well and to challenging Iran head to head. It may sound crazy to some people, but in today's Middle East, expect the unexpected. I don't think any of us sitting here right now can say where this is going. I think that's pretty clear. But number one, what is clear in terms of Israel's goals, Dinesh, destroy Hamas. That's number one, and we'll see what comes after that. But the Middle East will never be the same, no doubt, after what happened over the weekend and after this war. Eric Stackelback, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Eric Stackelback, folks, Senior News Director for TBN and the website WatchmanTV.com. Thanks. Thank you, Dinesh. Solzhenitsyn writes that at the end of 1944, when our army entered the Balkans, and especially in 1945 when it reached Central Europe, a wave of Russian emigres flowed into the channels of the Gulag. Most of them were old men who had left at the time of the revolution, but there were also young people who had grown up outside Russia. They usually dragged off the menfolk and left the women and children where they were. 
It was true, they didn't take everyone, but they took all those who, in the course of 25 years, this is from the Bolshevik Revol Revolution to 1944, had expressed even the mildest political views or who had expressed them earlier during the revolution. They did not touch those who had lived a purely vegetable existence. So, the Soviets have long memories. They remember that even though you have these Russians who are now not living in Russia, they're living in Eastern and Central Europe, but the truth of it is once the Soviet armies occupy those territories, you scoop up all those people and you bring them back to Russia and you go, wait a minute, weren't you the guy who opposed the Bolshevik Revolution 25 years ago? Or weren't you the guy when the Bolshevik Revolution was uh, first established, expressed some critical views to your neighbors and we've got a report that you were not on the side of the revolution? And guess what? It's time for you to be punished now. I mean, you think with the war, the massive carnage, the Soviet victory, they would be like, who cares about any of that? Let's forget about all that. That's all ancient history. Let's welcome these people back into the Soviet Union and maybe, no, none of that. This is not the attitude of a police state. And so they take these guys and ship them right off to the gulag. And now Solzhenitsyn turns to something that is actually very uncomfortable, which is that he points out that after World War II, the British and American governments rounded up Russian people who were in territories not under Soviet control, but under British control and American control and sent them back to the Soviet Union where they were promptly locked up in the Gulag. And this is a, an absolutely horrific a chapter in the history of World War II. And it's not a well-known chapter because think about it, in the sort of triumphalism that came after the war, the tremendous sense of relief, America won the war, we've defeated Nazism, it's the greatest generation, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of that was, was, was right and it was warranted and it was justified. But here was the problem. The problem was that the United States and Great Britain were allied with Stalin uh, in World War II. Now, this was not really an alliance, I would say, of friends, but it was an alliance of convenience because Hitler had invaded uh, Poland, provoking World War II and causing the British to declare war against Hitler. Later, Hitler invaded Russia, so obviously Stalin was now on the warpath against Hitler, and so the mutual enemies of Hitler made an alliance, which is the British the Americans and the Russians. But as a result of that alliance, uh, the British and the Americans go, okay, well, at the end of the war, the Soviet government is demanding that all Russians who have now, who are now in British or American occupied territories be sent home. Now, Solzhenitsyn goes into this. He says that um, the Russians who were living under the British or living under the Americans had left the Soviet Union because they knew that they would be hunted over there. They were, they were opponents of the Soviet regime. They were anti-communist. They didn't want to live in Soviet Russia. And so they had a false sense of security. We're living in the free world. We're living in the West. We're completely protected. So he goes, they were all sent to destruction on the archipelago. The American authorities did the same in Bavaria as well as on the US territory. They delivered tens of thousands of Soviet citizens to a cruel fate, turning them over to the Soviets against their will. I mean, this is a horrible scene where American and British troops come to these Soviet citizens. They're like, please do not send us back. Why? Because we, you are sending us to our debts. And the American and British soldiers go, sorry, get on the uh, airplane, get on the train, uh, off you go to Soviet Russia. There's going to be no, in other words, there was a deal made with Stalin, or at least there was a succumbing to Stalin's demand at the end of the war, send all my people back for me to deal with them however I see fit. And says Solzhenitsyn that um, there were Russians delivered into the hands of Stalin, but not only Russians. He goes, a certain number of Poles, members of the Home Army, arrived in the Gulag in 1945. There were a certain number of Romanians and Hungarians. At the end of the war and for many years after, there flowed 
uninterruptedly an abundant wave of Ukrainian nationalists. And so you have this remarkable phenomenon that even in the wake of victory, Stalin's approach is not let bygones be bygones, let's now work hard to reunify the Soviet Union, let's try to reconcile with Russians who have left our country who are now coming back. It's rather, let me tighten my hold on power, let me wreak vengeance on the Russians who never agreed with me or with the revolution. It's time to repopulate, even overpopulate, the Gulag. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.